Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to uh, talk today about multi-phase flow, and it's kind of a continuation of what we started on Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday. And uh, we're going to talk about the main concepts of multi-phase flow, which involves uh, basically the modification of this Darcy's Law. Uh, Darcy's Law, I'm sure everybody remembers, is that this Darcy velocity, which is not the same as the physical velocity, the Darcy velocity is equal to the ratio. It's actually a constant here. This constant is um, uh, consisting of two parts, a rock-related part of the constant and a fluid-related uh, part of the constant. The viscosity is the fluid and the permeability is the rock part. And then we have the basically the pressure drop uh, over some distance, delta in the flow direction. In this case, it's over distance L. So it would look something like that for an experiment that we're doing in the laboratory with a piece of, uh, piece of rock. Typically, it's about five. Uh, the samples that they collect from reservoirs, uh, they, um, when they drill a well, they collect uh, rock samples. They have a special drilling tool uh, that collects the core. And the core itself is probably um, maybe four to five inches, which is um, 12 to 15 centimeters in diameter. And then they take this core, which might be in sections of one meter or 10 meters, depending on how solid the core is, whether it breaks into pieces or not. Uh, they take little uh, and they'll drill out uh, small plugs from this large core, and then they'll make these experiments. Have, have they talked to you about the procedures? Yeah. Okay. So these small. So we're looking here. Maybe it's some small core plug. Uh, maybe 10, 10 centimeters uh, long, for example. It might be something like that. It might be about 10 square centimeters in, in uh, on the area, the face of the core where flow is entering, um, and. Um, you know, that's, that's the Darcy equation. Are there any questions about Darcy? We now know what kind of job he had. Nothing? Okay. So we're going to adapt this uh, flow model, this simple equation, to the situation where we have two phases flowing. We're going to talk about flowing, uh, for the sake of the class today, about flowing oil which in general in the petroleum industry is, 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 uh, has the color of green, and uh, water. We're going to talk about the situation where we flow both oil and water simultaneously through this uh, rock. Okay. So that's going to be the situation. Um, the uh, we go back up here. This velocity is, is the same as the volumetric rate divided by that cross-sectional area to flow here. And um, the um, in the laboratory, what we'll uh, actually do is one of two types of experiments where we're flowing uh, these two fluids together. Any reason why you think we might be flowing water together with oil, other than water is always there. So there's always going to be some water there. But why do you think it might be of particular interest to look at the simultaneously flow of water and oil? Any, any ideas? Yes. Yeah, uh, water is often injected. It's not always injected, but often it's injected to recover uh, more of the oil than if you just put holes in the ground and you just let Mother Nature push the oil out by its own pressure. Now, sometimes Mother Nature is very nice to us and provides large water uh, volumes connected to the oil, and they're so large that, in a sense, you don't need to inject water because the expansion of this water as you produce the oil, the water just comes in by 
natural, they call it water influx. Okay? But in either case, that you inject water or that you have this large water reservoir connected with your oil, reservoir, uh, your oil field, uh, in, in either case, both oil and water will flow simultaneously. And generally, the net effect is positive. It's good because you get re recovery, uh, uh, more oil recovery. So, so that's why we're going to talk about oil and water. We could just as well pick uh, gas and oil because we also, and in Norway it's very common, that we inject gas again to push the oil out of the reservoir and to get a higher recovery. But for the sake of what we're doing here, we'll talk about uh, this um, case here with oil and water. So if we go to the, to the laboratory with a core like this, and we're going to do experiments, we can do two types of laboratory experiments. Have these been discussed already or not? No. Okay. And the first type is, is maybe the simplest to understand. It's what we refer to as a steady state uh, experiment. Um, steady state, basically in this case, doesn't, well, what, steady state has a lot of different meanings in different situations. But in this case, what it really means is that we're going to inject, we're going to have a pump here, okay? I don't know exactly how to draw a pump. Let's say we've got a pump uh, uh, like this. We've got two pumps, actually. We've got a pump for the water and a pump for the oil. And we're going to be pumping oil and water simultaneously together into the core, okay? So that's the steady state experiment. So basically, this means that we have simultaneous injection or flow of oil and water into the core. Okay? So we know the rates, QO and QW. We can pick them as we like. Um, and basically, we continue flowing at those two rates until what happens? What do you think we would continue flowing at? Uh, basically, you flow it at uh, these constant rates time, and sometimes instead of time, we, we, we plot it as a function of the pore volumes. You know, this one pore volume would be the, uh, the pore volume is the bulk volume, which is what, uh, pi r squared <laughs> times the length, yeah? That's the bulk volume times the porosity, right? That would be the pore volume. And sometimes we represent that we've injected so many pore volumes of, of mixture instead of using time. So basically, this is a time-like scale. And what we measure as a function of pressure, uh, pressure drop across the core, the rates are constant. QO is constant. And QW is constant. They may be different from each other. And they often will. We'll run a 90. Let's say, uh, let's say 9 cc's per minute of uh, water and 10 cc's per minute of oil until it reaches steady state. And then we'll go to an 80-20 or 8-2 and a 7-3 you know, and so forth. All the different ratios. And each time what we're looking for is the pressure drop in the core to basically stabilize. And you go something like this and then it's going to stabilize. And if you just keep on going forever, it's not going to change. And steady state means that we go until this point and a little bit beyond. So at this point, we've reached steady state. Nothing's changing. Pressure drops constant. Uh, whatever happens inside the core, we don't really know, but it's now stabilized or steady. So this is reaching steady state. And uh, again, the, the ratios you might set up would be Q water, Q oil, typically in cc's per minute. Um, and you might go with uh, 9, 1, uh, 8, 2, you know, 7, 3, 5, 5, and so forth until you cover the entire range of all the possible from pure water to pure oil. Okay? 
from pure water to pure oil. So you might even have 10 and 0, and down here, 0 and 10. Okay? So that's a steady state experiment. And what's done in this experiment to, to calculate uh, from, the Darcy, uh, from the Darcy equation is that we use that Darcy equation for each phase separately. And we can solve this equation for the permeability once we reach steady state. So out in this region here, what we say is that the phase permeabilities uh, become go to being constants. Okay? Because nothing is changing in pressure drop. So we can calculate uh, KW. Uh, it will be reported in Darcy's or Milladarcy's and KO, again with maybe the same units. And just as an example, the KW would be equal to um, the uh, rate of water being injected divided by its area. And then it would be times the, uh, the viscosity of the water and then divided by this delta P. I think that's right. And the oil permeability, again at steady state, would be the oil rate divided by A, so the only difference is the rate there, and the viscosity of the oil instead of the water, but the delta P would be the same. So what we have the same in, in both here is, um, this is the same as this one, and the area, well, I can't do it here, but the area is also the same. Uh, the rates of each phase are different, and the viscosities may or may not be different, depending on what oil and water were uh, flowing. So this then gives us um, a series of, uh, of permeabilities. And then we, use, we introduce the definition of what's called um, relative permeability. Okay. And that's written as little k r and then the phase. So in, we'll just take water as an example. And that's defined as the permeability of the water phase itself in units, okay, divided by, and now it's a reference permeability. And here it, it differs. Uh, some people use one definition and other people use another definition. I think the formal definition is that this is the so-called absolute permeability, absolute as in the drink, absolute permeability with an E on the end, okay? The absolute permeability is the permeability measured for a single phase flowing in the core. In other words, there's only one phase in the core. It's water filled, you're flowing water, you measure the permeability, you get uh, 100 millidarsis, okay? And if you take and you get rid of all the water and you flow only oil, uh, viscosity three centipoise, you flow it, only oil, there's no water. We extract all the water out, there's only oil flowing, you should get exactly the same absolute permeability, independent of the fluid. Okay? So that's the absolute permeability. So that's not related to the phase. This is the relative permeability of water, and then you have the same thing for oil. Uh, written like that. Okay? So that's basically this definition of relative permeability. And that's our main concept of um, uh, that we basically go and measure these, these quantities here. So these would be translated into K, R, W, and K, R, O. Okay. Now, the... Um, Once we measure these, uh, you, you'd like to correlate them as a function of something, okay? And uh, so the question is uh, how these relative permeabilities correlate uh, as a function of, of something. What, what do you think might be uh, the, the main variable uh, to correlate these? Do you have any kind of intuitive feeling for... Based on these measurements here, do you see anything? Um, okay, well, 
what we can what we can say is that if we at the end of each experiment, okay, at the end of each experiment, what you can do is you can take the core and by weighing it, okay, by weighing it, what can you find out? Okay, let's say that we have oil and water. Let's say that we've got uh, the density of water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter or one gram per cc. And the oil, let's say, is 800. Okay? So if I take your, if I take this core out, okay, and I put it on a, on a weight, on a deck, then what can you tell me? What can you tell me? About how much oil and how much water is in the core? Can you, can you tell me that? Okay. Uh, well, let's just, if, if you're not sure, are you sure? Okay. So let's just look the weight, or we'll just say the mass of the core, right? That's equal to the mass of the, uh, let's just say the rock, okay? Evacuated. You take away all the air, you, you know, you just you evacuate it. There's nothing inside the pores, okay? Uh, so it's the rock plus the mass of the water plus the mass of the oil. There is nothing else, right? Yeah? And the mass of the water is what? What's the mass of the water? Well, it's the volume of the water times its density, which we know is one gram per cc. And the mass of the oil is the volume of the oil times the density of the oil, right? So if we know the total mass, the weight in grams of the core plus the oil in the water after experiment, what's this? This is always the same, right? You just measure that at the beginning. This is a constant. So we always know that, okay? Now, the vo we know this and we know this. So basically we have two unknowns, right? We have two unknowns, water volume and oil volume. But what do we know about those two volumes? That the sum of the two is equal to what? That pore volume. But that is constant. That's known and constant, right? which means that you really only have one unknown because we can now say that the mass of the core is the mass of the rock plus, and now we can just uh, we can write it out here, the volume of water, the density of water, plus the pore volume minus the volume of water is what? What's the difference between the pore volume and the water? That's the oil volume times the oil density. So basically we know this, we know that, we know that, and we know that. We only have one unknown. So if you measure the weight of the core, you can calculate the volume of the water, and then you can calculate the volume of the oil. And then I suppose that in the previous lectures you've talked about saturations, right? Saturation is the water volume divided by what? What is the saturation of water defined as? The water volume divided by what? The pore volume. Okay? So getting the oil volume and the water volume, we can calculate the saturations. Oil volume over pore volume. So basically by a simple gravit gravit gravitometric uh, measurement, just weighing the core, we can find the saturation of oil and water in the core. That's simple. So it's a very simple experiment. You just flow with two pumps. You flow with two pumps until you reach a steady state pressure drop. You take that pressure drop in the Darcy equation, calculate the phase permeabilities, 
divide by the absolute permeability, which is a known. You now have the relative permeabilities, and we can calculate the saturation uh, of either phase, let's just say water, for example, simply by measuring the weight of the core itself. Okay? There's no magic, no complications. It's really simple. You can do it at home. Okay, if you like. So that's basically giving us saturation. And it ends up that it is saturation that's the primary variable in correlating relative permeability. Okay? Saturation is the primary variable in correlating relative permeability. And in a two-phase system like this, there's only oil and water, you only need to know one saturation. In other words, the KRO will correlate with SW the same as KRW will correlate with, um, with SW. So we're just going to write it KRW as a function of water saturation and KRO as a function of water saturation. Okay? Those, those are the main, uh, that is the main correlating variable. And the shape of that curve, the shape of the so-called relative permeability saturation curve, you can imagine my kids had so much fun when I brought this computer home three years ago, you know, I mean, playing and, you know, it's just, it's, it's pretty good. Cool. It's so much better than chalk. Uh, it's, it's, okay. So now we can sketch what the relative permeability curves will look like. I'll try to do that on a plot looks like this and make it big enough hopefully that you can square plot. Now what's the range of relative permeability? Please help me out so I don't have to go point to somebody. What is the numerical range of relative permeability from what to what? Zero to one. Zero to one. Okay. So now we're going to plot KR on the y-axis and what is the range of saturation? Thank you. Zero to 100 percent. Okay, so this is it. It's a square plot. We've got zero to one, zero to one, and then <clears throat> what we're going to do is um, I'm going to sketch kind of a generic the way it will look in in general. I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to say that uh, our original core. Every time we start this experiment, let's say we restart the, the experiment with this core as it is in the reservoir. Okay? That's the most realistic kind of experiment. You know about capillary pressure, right? You know about uh, conate water saturation or irreducible water saturation, I hope? No? The capillary pressure curve, that, that, you know, it's, uh, okay, let's just, let's just do a um, did you talk about centrifuge experiments or capillary pressure curves? I know capillary pressure curve, yeah? Because it was in the exercise we looked at. Okay. All right. Now we're going to do another experiment. Well, we're going to take another experiment just to revisit capillary pressure. Okay. We're going to take that same core. We're going to put it and we're going to fill it full of, uh, of uh, water to begin with water. Okay. And we're going to put it into a centrifuge. Okay, and around in this in this centrifuge, I'm going to basically we're going to swing this thing around, this uh, uh, rock around and around at very high speeds, and on the outside of the core, we're going to put oil. Okay, and what's going to happen is that the the acceleration due to the centrifugal acceleration is going to push the oil into the core and push the water out. Okay, it's going to drain the water out of the core, and the faster we spin it, the more water it will push out. Okay, believe it or not, you don't have to believe me, but that's what's going to happen. And finally, you spin it and you spin it so high that no more water comes out. Okay, and that is what we call the irreducible. Um, in Norwegian, I don't know. The irreducible water saturation. Okay? And that's typically the kind of water saturation you find in oil and gas reservoirs. Okay? 
but it wasn't a centrifugal force that was driving the water out and the oil in. What was it? It had to be some kind of force. What kind of acceleration do we have? Gravity. It was the acceleration due to gravity. So it was the gravitational force, the density difference between oil and water, the gravity force, that basically the oil came into the reservoir, went to the top because it was lighter, and it pushed the oil out. And the one problem you had in the class tells you how to calculate versus depth the water saturation, okay, I think, something like that. Okay. And at the very top of the reservoir, you have the maximum effect of this capillary force, and you have the lowest water saturation. <laughs> So we're going to start this experiment just um, at what we call the irreducible water saturation, because that's a realistic starting point uh, within the reservoir. So we'll call this SWI, irreducible or initial, but initial is not quite as good a word. This is irreducible. Saturation. Now, um, at that point, how many think what? How many think that the oil? Now we've got uh, you know it looks like about twenty percent, right? Saturation irreducible twenty percent. What do you think that the KRO? This is the KRO, the oil relative permeability. It's eighty percent filled. Uh, the pores are eighty percent filled with oil and twenty percent with water. On Tuesday, which pores did I say is probably filled with water? Remember? Water, let's say, is the wetting phase. The wetting phase tends to be in the smaller pores. Okay? In the smaller pores. So the oil is in the larger pores, and 80% of the total pore volume is full with oil. What do you think the relative permeability is? Equal to 1? You think it's equal to one? Why not? The water will block. The oil cannot pass through some of those smaller pores. To get one, you need the oil filling and flowing through all of the connected <coughs> pores. Okay? So it's going to be less. So it's going to be somewhere, let's say, right about here. Okay? That's, that's the initial oil permeability. Okay, And then as you get more and more water in the system, what do you think is going to happen to that oil permeability? Each time, each time you, you change this uh, range here, as we're getting more and more water, let's say we're going in, as we're going in this direction here, what do you think the permeability of oil is doing here? We're starting at point 0.8 here, KRG. I'm sorry, KRO, and then as it, as you get more and more water flowing, it's dropping, right? It's getting less and less. So this thing drops, and it doesn't drop linearly. It typically drops quite rapidly, something like this. And, and then it'll actually reach zero somewhere about here. Okay. It will reach zero somewhere uh, down here. And then the water uh, curve will look something like this. Um, in this case, we could start an experiment that started up here, okay, in theory. That's not the experiment we're doing because we're actually starting with this one here. So in this experiment, what you're going to find, we'll just mark this, okay? The permeability of water now, when you've gotten to this point, is going to be less than one, probably something down like this, maybe even lower. And its curve will look something like this, okay? It has zero permeability here because that, that was the definition. No more water left. 
and we get this two curve. So we've got the oil curve and the water curve, and um, it's got kind of a kink there, but it's not, not intended to be like that. It should be generally smooth. Okay. Now, this saturation here, where the oil stops flowing, that's a very important saturation point. This is this this is uh, basically what we have here. It's one minus what is called the residual oil saturation. This is the residual oil saturation. Okay, we inject water, or Mother Earth provides water, pushes the oil. Okay, but it won't be able to push all of the oil out because some of the oil will be trapped. And the amount that's trapped is this residual oil saturation. So that's a very important uh, uh, number. It's kind of the oil we can't get out. It's what's left in step yard and equifisk and things like that. We've been injecting lots of water, and a lot of oil is left there. Typically, the range of this residual oil saturation uh, is um, somewhere between 10 and 40%. Okay, that you can't push away with water. The irreducible water saturation that we start with can range anywhere from five to fifty percent. Okay, from five to fifty percent. Okay. So these are the curves. And then the next thing we'll say about these is that in general we can, we can write uh, Kr is proportional with saturation uh, of the same phase to some exponent n. Okay? And n is typically anywhere from 2 to 4. I'll say 2 plus to 4. Now, the exponent might be different for oil than for water, okay? But in general, it's got this kind of relationship. So we can say if this is a given phase, water, water, and water, and you'll have a similar type equation, SO and some exponent in O. Now you might, as a first assumption, say that they're the same, but they don't have to be. They can be a factor of one different. One could be two and a half, one could be three and a half. These are, these are called saturation exponents. Very, very important numbers in uh, quantifying, measuring. We spend a lot of money to get them. The other thing that's very important is this residual oil, the in irreducible water saturation, and these saturations are called end point saturations because they're the end of the road. <laughs> okay? It's where this permeability is zero and it's where this permeability is zero. So these are called end point saturations. And these are also key numbers to measure. Of course, the permeability at the endpoint saturations are obviously important as well. And are there any questions? Okay. Basically, this is what they look like every reservoir in the world. But there's a pretty big range here, pretty big range here, and actually, because this is a power, it's a pretty big range here. If it's four, they drop very quickly. It's not good. <laughs> okay? The permeabilities drop very quickly. The lower this number, the less effect you have. Okay? The lower, the better. If you don't see that, then. Now, um, there was one other thing I lost. 
track of uh, wanting to say um, so it's the endpoint saturations, it's the permeability, relative permeabilities at the endpoints, and it's these exponents. Um, Okay, maybe I'll remember it later. So what we would consider is that rock, each rock, the, being rock properties, okay, meaning that every rock, the chalk, has an expo exponent of about one. If you're interested, okay, for not that's not right. Uh, take, take that away. It was, it was, uh, that was that was totally wrong. <laughs> it was, uh, it's a poor size distribution of, of that one. Forget that. The rock properties are this. Basically, it's the SWI, the SOR, and this exponent, and also the endpoint saturations. We can call those uh, KRO at SWI and KRW at SOR. Okay? These are all characteristics of the rock itself. They're going to be different for every rock in every different field. So they're important numbers that have to be quantified for a given rock. Now, <clears throat> there's other dependencies of relative permeability, which I think I'll wait until after the break to, to talk about. Um, there's some other dependencies that are important, and we'll come back to those after the break. Before the break, what I want to do is I want to finish talking about the second kind of experiment uh, used to measure uh, relative permeability. Okay, the first was steady state. It was a very simple experiment. Um, the second one is a little more realistic of actually what's going on down in the reservoir. Okay, because down in the reservoir you actually have all this oil, and here comes the water from the outside. Okay, and actually displaces the oil. The experiment that we conducted here is that we're flowing these two phases simultaneously. It's kind of, it's, it's not cheating, but it's not exactly the same process as what's in the reservoir. So this next process, which is a more complicated um, process, the second type of experiment is called unsteady state. Relative permeability experiment. And basically, the, what we do is we start with a core at SWI, typically. Okay, so it's full of oil. The water has no mobility, no permeability, right? Because it's at SWI. Okay, so basically the KRW is zero, and the KRO is this. You know, something might be. 0.72 or something. And then, for example, okay. and then we inject only water into the core. Okay? We only inject water into the core. And we measure pressure drop. across the core. And what we measure flowing out of the core is the rate of oil and the rate of water. And then what's done is that um, because we know the water in and we know the water out, we know the oil out, by material balance, in this case, because we can't take and weigh the core continuously, but you can do a material balance 
Okay? You know what's in the core to begin with. You know what you put in and you know what you've taken out. You can calculate the average saturation of oil and water as a function of time. Okay? During the experiment. You have delta P as a function of time and using a certain theory we'll talk briefly about, uh, displacement flow theory. It's a very complicated mathematical theory, but you can translate the delta P time into KRW as a function of time and KRO as a function of time. And this requires, this is complex stuff, this is um, displacement flow theory. It was originally set forth by a couple of guys during Second World War while you guys were being occupied, the Germans. A couple of guys, Buckley and Leverett, working for an oil company, were busy developing this theory. Buckley-Leverett theory. I know exact year, during the war. 1940, something like that. And actually, the mathematics to solve this problem, anybody here is good in mathematics? Okay, well then, you if you're good in mathematics and want a good mathematical challenge, the, theoret the mathematical theory that's needed to, to verify this wasn't even created back then in the 1940s. Okay, it's called, uh, uh, what's it called? I, I, I don't understand it, but it's, some, some mathematical theory. Uh, the method of characteristics. Method of has anybody heard about that? Did you have that in your math course? Well, your your grandparents who were studying here, maybe during the war, they hadn't heard of math, method of characteristics in their math courses because it didn't exist. So anyway, it's a very interesting uh, flow theory, and it allows you to interpret this pressure drop and, 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 and relative permeability uh, to convert it into relative permeabilities. By material balance, we can get the saturations. And then we can combine this together to provide KR uh, as a function of saturation. Okay, So all of this leads to KR as a function of saturation. Okay. So it's more complicated. You can't do this at home. Uh, you can, but it, it's uh, okay. All right. Any questions then? So these are two types of experiments. Um, okay. See if there's anything on my. Yeah, I was gonna. I know. I was gonna ask you guys to do the thought problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to uh, to our steady state experiment because it's easier. It's easier to uh, to think through. Okay. Okay. What I want you to do, what I want you to do, is try to sketch what you think the delta P will look like for these different experiments. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to say this is going from 1 to 0. The water saturation, you can use that as your variable. It's basically uh, more water versus less water. Do you have a higher or a lower pressure drop and how do you think it will change as a function of saturation? So that was what I was going to ask you to do up there. I'll, I'll, I'll let you do it because I give you no time to do it uh, unless you want to use your break. Uh, we'll start the the next hour with this thought problem. Okay. So basically, we're looking at water saturation along here and delta P along here, and that's for a steady state experiment. 
And um, so if we start, uh, if we, let's say that we started that experiment, this is SWI. If we started each experiment um, at SWI, and we put this pressure drop at SWI, um, We'll put that pressure drop right here. Okay. Then I would like you to to try to sketch through how do you think it would look as you go towards one here. Okay, that pressure drop. And I'll even sketch in here somewhere this point where the oil stops flowing. One minus S O R. Okay, so we'll take a break, 15 minute break. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, the uh, the, the little problem here I'll let you uh, kind of have is a thought, a thought problem. Um, but uh, one thing I will, will note for you is that the, uh, <coughs> the permeability, um, the total permeability, if you, if you want to say that, is that the permeability of water uh, plus oil that will always be less than the absolute permeability. So you always lose, in a sense, a kind of a net total permeability. Um, another way to think about this is that the sum of the rel perms will always be less than one. So that's just a general uh, characteristic. Now, the other thing I'll mention is that whether this is going in this direction or this direction, has anybody thought about that? In other words, uh, uh, this direction and then whether it ends up on, on this side or on this side. What do you think is the main a main issue in determining that and in which direction it's going to move towards. Pressure drop is equal to what? The rate or total velocity, right? Um, times like that. <clears throat> okay. I'll just let you think through this. But uh, anybody want to suggest what, what you think is the mine, main driving Parameter whether it kind of goes higher or lower the the, the total pressure drop, uh, let's say at the extreme, because, because here we have only oil flowing, right? And at this point we have water only flows. Okay. And those endpoint relative permeabilities at least the way I sketched them, were less than one, but they were both about the same order of magnitude, right? These two here. They weren't radically different. So what do you think it is that drives it one, one direction or the other?
both cases at the endpoints here, this is the same number, right? It's 10 cc's per minute. And the permeability of a particular phase, either here or here, is the absolute permeability times this k star, kr star, and the kr star is about the same number. Okay. So this is phase velocity, phase viscosity, and phase permeability. But this is absolute permeability times this kr star, this relative permeability. And this relative permeability, we said, was at 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, this, this order of magnitude. <clears throat> So what's left? This is more or less the same. This is more or less the same. Okay. Let's say our oil viscosity is a hundred centipoise, a hundred times water viscosity. One hundred times would you require more or less pressure drop to get the same 10 cubic centimeters per minute through the core? The more viscous it is, the more or less pressure drop. Okay? So basically the oil viscosity is controlling here and the water viscosity is controlling there. Because otherwise, at the two endpoints here, the other, the other parts of the pressure drop are the same. The, the velocity is the same. Permeability of the phase is approximately the same. So it's going to be controlled by this contrast in uh, viscosity. Okay. So if the water viscosity is less than the oil viscosity, it will go which direction? Okay. Okay, so this is water viscosity being less than the oil viscosity, and this is going to be water viscosity being greater than oil viscosity. And you can have either case. In Norway, oils are very light, very nice oil here in Norway. So the average oil viscosity is around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 centipoise. Now there are exceptions to that. Troll is a little higher, uh, 3 centipoise. Um, there's a few that are up in, you know, greater than one centipoise, but most of them are quite low. Water viscosity, I told you on Tuesday, was always about, you remember? No? Come on. I haven't been studying your notes the whole week. About 0.5 centipoise, no matter where you are in the world, about 0.5. This is always about 0.5 centipoise at reservoir conditions. Over there, or wherever there is water in this room, if there's any water, it's one centipoise at room temperature. But at reservoir temperature, 100 degrees C, 60 degrees C, 130 degrees C, aquifisk, it's more like 0.5 centipoise. Okay, so that's enough. That's basically, then the rest of it you can try to figure out yourself whether you think it's monotonically changing or not, and uh, let you think through that. Now, <clears throat> <clears throat> the the KR we now know is primarily a function of saturation, and we're going to talk about some of the other uh, things that are important to the relative permeability. And the next on the list is um, there's probably two that are competing about which one's more important. But the next one I want to talk about is um, The um, the direction of saturation change. 
Okay, the, I'm gonna. I can't really. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it. Um, uh, let's call it delta S W over delta T. Okay, is it positive or negative? Okay, I'm saying w water is the wetting phase. I'm just going to make that assumption. So I'm saying that if the change in water saturation, if it is growing with time. If it's increasing with time, that would have a positive sign. And if the water saturation is decreasing with time, then it would be the other, opposite. It would be negative. Okay. Now, if you have increasing wetting phase saturation, which I'm just going to say is what? Wetting phase saturation. That is referred to as, anybody know what it's called? Did they talk about that? That's on? No. Imbibition. Okay, if I had my coffee cup here, my sokobit, so you know, I would show you imbibition, you know? You put the, the sugar cube on top of the coffee and the sugar cube becomes black, right? Sucks in, that's imbibition. Water saturation is increasing. Before, the sugar cube has air only. And then the water comes in and bibes into the sugar cube. That's imbibition. And the decreasing <coughs> saturation of the wetting phase, let's say water in general, is referred to as drainage. Okay? And this direction of saturation change uh, sometimes has a big effect, sometimes has no effect on uh, the relative permeability uh, uh, relationship. So that's number two on the list. And again, it just depends. Sometimes it's important and sometimes it's not. In the case of water, oil, what do you think is the normal process? What do you, what, what's the normal process? Is it drainage or imbibition? Imbibition, because we're we're either putting water into the reservoir, displacing the oil, or Mother Nature is putting water into the reservoir, displacing the oil. So basically, this is the main, um, uh, uh, most common process. Now, the next is what we're going to talk about is called wettability, and wettability is. <clears throat> It's kind of like, you know what a Teflon pond? Te they call it Teflon? Yeah. Okay. No, easy to get the egg off. And if you're using an old pan, third generation, when you came to Trondheim, you moved your, your folks sent with you an old pan that they didn't want anymore. All the Teflon was scratched off. Okay. Teflon is a material that changes the wetting, right? It makes it repellent to sticking. Okay. And... Um, some rocks, like water, the 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 I don't know what you want to call it. The um, uh, the the forces, the water molecules, uh, uh, basically uh, tend to wet the rock surface, or they don't. The best way to show you this would be is that if I had a rock, a piece of chalk here, which is back there, everybody's sitting a little further away today because they don't want the, my 20 crowns, they want their water. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, maybe we'll try to do an experiment. I don't think I have 20 crowns today, so you have to be a little bit careful. If I take your water, you may not get anything in return. Except a good grade, except I probably won't be grading. So, okay. so we're going to do this experiment. Who wants to give me their water? Mm -hmm. Just I, all I need is a drop. I don't need a lot. I'm not. You can drink it after I'm done. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to put this drop of water on the. What do you think is going to happen if I put the water? Okay. You think it's going to go in? You don't know. Anybody got a good feeling? Sink in or imbibe? Because now that we're you know sophisticated engineers almost getting paid to be here. 
Okay? He thinks it's going to imbibe. I'm not sure. You're probably right. See if it disappears. Yeah. Went straight in. Did you see it disappear? Okay, we'll try again. Okay, so we're going to saturate this sucker. So this has a huge... Here's just, you thought you were going to have some water left, but it's, it's all just imbibing in there. there now the guy who's supposed to actually be teaching this course is being lazy. <coughs> you get that? Being lazy in, the, in America. He's on sabbatical. He's Ola Torshetta. And uh, he, uh, he did his PhD back in the early 80s, I think, or maybe late 70s, I don't know. Um, doing ex this, exactly this kind of experiment. They gave him a PhD. You know? He just took chalk. And, but the chalk was from Ecofisk. And the, there's two primary geologic formations in, in Ecofisk, the, uh, the Danian and the Mastrician, or the Tor and the Ecofisk, they call them. Uh, they're different time periods. And the one, the upper one, always behaved like this. Water just you know, went straight in, the oil went out, it was great. It looked very good, looked, looked quite optimistic. Uh, but then the other one, uh, every other core, uh, sometimes the water just stayed on top, didn't go in at all. Okay? And uh, so there was this uncertainty, and nobody had ever done water injection in a chalk reservoir like this, ever in the world. In fact, the Ecofis area chalk is very unique. It's just, just like this. So it was a very, uh, uh, it was a huge uh, uncertainty factor. The wettability of the chalk was unknown. They, they, they couldn't define it. It was clearly water wet or oil wet and they weren't sure. So they almost around 1990, in the early 1990s, instead of injecting water, we started looking at injecting nitrogen, and I was involved in that research. And during that about four years of research with nitrogen injection in Ecofisk, they actually decided to do a pilot where they drilled some special wells and they did they built all the infrastructure, a lot of money, and tried injecting water into Ecofisk just to see if it would work in the field. Because Torshetter's results were too uncertain. They didn't want to put all the money into it and go for forward full blast, and they were not sure if they just wanted to use something else. Okay, so they did this pilot test. They call it a pilot test. And the pilot test was in this upper formation where things looked good, and they ended up being fantastic. The pilot test was a huge success. One of the, probably the biggest enhanced oil recovery successes I anywhere in the world. The production of Ecofisk was about a half a million barrels per day, which is what troll a few of the fields make, half a million barrels per day. It was down to about 75,000 barrels per day. They found out about the sinking and everything going on. They did this pilot test. It was hugely successful. And if you go into the oil directorate uh, in Pédé d'Otnou and you look at the oil production for, Equ for Equifisk, you see it came back up to half a million barrels per day. It's, it's on its way down again. But it's going to have a life of about 60 years. It's a fantastic field. And this water uh, injection has been successful. Then they did another pilot in the lower formation where it was uncertain. Also big success. Great success. They're just now starting water injection in ball hall, which is also chalk, but it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's more like a sugar cube. It's got a very, mechanical stability is very low. They were worried about the mechanical stability if they injected water that it might just turn into like a sugar cube, like a sugar cube turns when you put coffee on it. It just has no mechanical strength. But they decided to go with water injection in, in, uh, in uh, wall hall also. So we're not sure how that's going to turn out. So wettability is this decision of the rock whether it likes water, prefers water, or, or doesn't. Okay, And it's very easy to test for wettability by just dropping a, piece of wa a little water on a piece of rock. And uh, so this is called water wet rock. Now we know you're right. Okay. So that's the wettability, and then there's there's a few other stuff down here. But basically, these are the main uh, things that determine the relationship between relative permeability and saturation. And um, yeah, so I think that's that's uh, gosh, that's uh, those are the things that uh, really wanted to talk about. Um, 
I put on the on the it's learning thing here. I put a set of like five pages I wrote for a course many years ago. About I think it was 1992. I'll, I'll try to pick it up here. I don't know. Download and print. No, here it is. It's down here. Um, short notes. Short notes on uh, relative permeability. You should be happy with me because it's like five pages instead of 50 pages. And um, I used to do a very bad job of teaching a course on uh, environmental uh, flow and groundwater systems. And this, this was the first thing I had to do was write a set of notes, subsurface multiphase flow. And uh, I was a really lousy teacher. I was a subject I didn't know much about. It was groundwater flow, so I didn't really care about it. There was no oil and gas. There was no money in it. So I, you know, the students, they hated me and, and so forth and so on. But anyway, I wrote this set of notes. And it's, um, so anyway, it talks, it talks about, it talks about these equations, you know, the definitions of relative permeabilities. And it kind of summarizes the stuff that I tried to talk about today. And it talks a little bit about this bundle of capillaries theory which is the basis for the standing set of relative permeability notes. And there's some equations here. Uh, so anyway, this is a short set of notes that I think will be uh, maybe of some interest in summarizing. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm just, tell, I'm just going like this. I'm not really giving you anything you can use as engineers, OK? This is something you can actually use, the equations and, and to, to, to make use of. Uh, in your in your future, so this is a set of notes that um, that I put out there, and I think it's a good idea. You probably try to, to download them and print them and read them. So um, that uh, discusses this uh, uh, this application of the bundle of capillaries theory that. Um, that is a very good approximation for describing the behavior of rocks. Um, there's a bundle of capillaries uh, approximation to the chalk. It's a very good one. Uh, the pore diameters, I told you yesterday, uh, Tuesday, it was from 0.1 to 1 micron. So the, the size of the diameters is very limited. And there's a distribution. It uh, looks like that. And, and you can figure out what, what percentage of the total porosity is in a certain pore size. You can use, what was his name, the law for flow. Poisel, yeah, for each capillary to find out the resistance or the perme effective permeability for each capillary that's full of water versus each capillary that's full of oil. So you can calculate the rate of, of each phase in each capillary. And then um, in addition to that, you can use the same model to describe the so-called capillary uh, pressure curve. Um, that's uh, the same theory used for the capillary pressure and relative permeability. Um, so that bundle of capillary model is, is, is an important uh, uh, analogy. It's a first order quantitative analogy. So that's, uh, anybody come from Stavanger here? There you go. There's a professor down there at the university called Chevalon, Saint Chevalon. Do you know? He used to be in the newspapers. Saint Chevalon. He was the guy who tried to get the Rugelon to become a university, University of Stavanger. He worked for many years. He was the one who got in trouble because he was sending emails who saying that, you know, stuff he wasn't supposed to say, and then Vega got a hold of him. And, you know, he, was, he was mad at the politicians because they wouldn't let University of Stavanger become University of Stavanger. It's actually a very good university in petroleum. I would say the teachers there are, are as good or better than, than us, <laughs> certainly in some subjects. And Sven Chevalon has, has kind of been the one who started that university in the petroleum department. He handpicked and hired the best PhDs from Antinou over the years and, and built up a really fine program. He, the last five or six years in his research, has developed to the, to the maximum this bundle of capillaries theory for very complicated multiphase flow, including three phase, gas, oil, and water, imbibition, drainage, capillary pressure. It's, it's really a nice suite of publications that he has in this subject. Um, so um, 
And relative permeability, multiphase flow is, is a very important uh, issue in, um, in recovery mechanisms, in oil reservoirs, um, also in gas reservoirs. Uh, the encroachment of water into the gas reservoir is very important, and the displacement of the gas by the water is, is, comes into play. So um, anyway, multiphase flow, relative permeability. Shoot, I didn't have a whole lot more to talk about. Maybe we have to actually do some calculations or something. Or just go home early. What do y'all want to do? Any calculations? Hmm? Getting uh, some questions. I mean, give, you know, give me a break. Uh, the volleyball guys, where are you? Right there. Okay, let's send, send the ball down here. See, the story is I, I haven't done exercise in 25, 26 years. But I was actually playing uh, volleyball for the Antinulog when I came in 19, I don't even remember what year it was, 78. And, you know, I wasn't the best player, but I, you know, I, but the the best players they actually went into patrolling. A couple of them. Morton Nicholson, he's the guy in Bergen, uh, Norse Hydro, now Hydro Stato Hydro, and uh, there's a couple other. Uh, so anyway, it's uh, there's your volleyball. Uh, I don't have any stories. You can ask any kind of questions, you know, about uh, this multi-phase fl flow stuff, PVT. Uh, did you talk to your folks about being persecuted on Tuesday? Did you tell them that I... Okay, I, I told your aunt. She said... No. So any, any questions about any of the stuff we've been talking about? Patrol in. I mean, this is a general course. Anything. I'm not like a politician. If I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. And then we'll go on to the next question. Anything that you're curious about, patrol in. Uh, next year, because next year you get me. I think most of you have to listen to me, you know, five hours a week, you know, the whole semester. Any questions about anything? Yeah, what do you teach? I teach this course expanded to a whole course uh, for you guys at least. That's uh, basically this PVT, the thermodynamics of oil and gas, and flow, the introduction to flow and porous media. So. Um, yeah, that's this kind of stuff. So. Reservoir engineering, a little bit of production. Um, all right, did anybody bring your calculators? I'm sure you didn't, you know, because I uh, next year you don't have calculators even. Right? Okay, I, I actually had set up a little problem to to give you. I wanted you to calculate uh, like the pressure drop for uh, for an example, but y'all y'all don't have a calculator with you, right? Does anybody have a calculator? Okay, she's got a calculator. Actually, I've got Excel on this. We'll do a little work. We'll work a little example, just uh, so we can say we did some examples. Um, okay, so let's let's take an example where we take um, uh, ten centimeter long and let's look at chalk since you know I really love Equifisk it's a it's a great technical uh, story this uh, Equifisk so we'll look at chalk and so we've got a permeability I'm gonna say a good piece of uh, chalk is uh, five millidarcies and they write it M little d um, MD which is uh, 10 uh, so like a thousand millidarcies is, is one darcy I'll give you some, okay? And um, and then we've got uh, an area. We're just going to say about ten square centimeters, okay? And um, porosity is about. Uh, we'll give it thirty-five percent set, thirty-five percent porosity, which is about an average in Equifis. And Conate water saturation or initial irreducible water saturation is quite low in chalks. It's very low, relatively low. It's uh, maybe 0.2 less. Okay. Okay. So now uh, let's do a steady state experiment. We're going to design a steady state experiment. 
and I want to know the pump rate. Okay, the pump rate for water and for oil uh, to get a pressure drop in the lab maximum five bar. We're going to say we're going to have a maximum pressure drop uh, of five bar. So we want to kind of design for that. Five bar pressure drop across this 10, a very short centimeter, five bar. Okay. See if we've got all the information we need. We've got the permeability, uh, the length, area. We've got some extra stuff there. And, um, and what I'd like to do, I'd like to inject um, a water injection of um, of the total of 80%. Okay, and uh, the rest of it we can flow. We're going to do a steady state. We're going to flow both. 20% uh, of the of the pump total pump rate will be uh, going to the to the water, and 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 80% to push the water in, and 20% to push the oil in. So we'll have this pump here, and we'll have a diverter, and we'll divert it such that 20% uh, moves in here and. 80% moves in here, and this is our basically our our water container, and then that will go, and that'll be our oil container, and we'll move that out, and then our core is here. Okay, so we want to design this experiment. So now you guys are smart enough to go to work for ResLab. You guys know about ResLab? Anybody know about ResLab? There's a guy. Uh, they just sold 100 million dollars. Uh, Res Lab to Weatherford, a little company came out of Oklahoma where I come from. One hundred million dollars is like only half a billion crowns. So it's not like Yucca but it's not bad. So the guy who sold it and developed Res Lab, he used to do this kind of thing together with Torsetter in the laboratory when I came here. And then they built this big company and, and expanded it. So then you can go to work for Res Lab, just knowing how to do this kind of stuff. If you know, if you understand what we've been talking about. Now we're missing a few things. What are we missing? That's the first thing you, you can find out about me, is that when I give you a problem, I probably won't give you enough information, and that's because no problem you solve in real life, somebody the boss is going to come in and say, "Well, here's all the information, exactly only what you need, just like an exam, you know," and you solve this problem. And when you get done, I will know the answer, and then you can I'll check it for you. Okay? It, it just doesn't work that way. First, your boss, who tells you what to do, probably doesn't even understand what he's asking for, okay? Because he got to be a boss, or she got to be a boss for other reasons, okay? They don't know what you need. Maybe you don't know what you need yet. You have to figure out what you need to solve the problem. And then once you finally solve the problem, who's going to grade it? Who's going to say, oh, this is right? Well, basically, you're the best judge of what's right and what's wrong. Not the boss, for sure. Now, the boss might see if you made some unit error so that you're producing a factor of 200 more than you should have because you know you, you made some unit errors. But basically, the problem you're asked to solve hasn't been solved. So you're the one who has to grade your, yourself. You have to figure out what data you need, and you have to figure out whether your answer is right. That's why I don't give Lustnitz for Schlag in my uh, thing uh, next year. So you have something to look forward to. Okay, So you have to try to figure out, what are we missing in the way of data to use Darcy's law here? There's a couple of pieces. Come on. Viscosities. Okay. Viscosity of oil in equifisk, 0.2 centipoint. Now we're doing this experiment at lab conditions, but I'll find some oil that mimics the oil in equifisk, 0.2 centipoints. You don't need to ask me about this, do you? Just to make it complicated, is it 0.55? Okay. 130 degrees uh, C, reservoir temperature. 
in equipoise. Okay, we got the, what else do we need? What else do we need? I'm going to change this from point 0.2 to point 0.1 just for because okay. the good chalk has in other words if you if you fill this by the way it's still wet I can feel it if I fill this with the water there okay and then I put it into a centrifuge at really high rates and the air pushed out the water again probably the water saturated would get down somewhere between 5 and 10% in this chalk yes how high was the temperature in Equifisk? Yeah. About 130 degrees C. Why is it so high? Uh, well, that's not. I mean, it's not high. It's higher than some reservoirs, but it's. It, you know, it's. Uh, I don't know how deep it is. Maybe close to 4,000 meters. Yeah. So. Reservoir temperatures in, in the North Sea vary probably from 60 to 160. See? Okay. Anything else we need to know? <clears throat> Anything else we need to know? Or we need to estimate. Well, what is flowing through this uh, core here? Blow the core up. What's flowing through this? We got 80% water coming in. We got oil coming in, right? The pressure drop across this core is equal to, what is it? Um, viscosity of, I don't know, just pick water, I guess, over. The K, but the K is the absolute K, which is 5 times KRW, right? And we got L here somewhere. And then what else do we got? Rate for velocity, which is rate over this area. Is that right? I, I, probably, I, got it, I probably got it upside down here. This is velocity. Now, this can't be right. Uh, velocity is equal to K over mu delta P over L. So it's velocity. So this is wrong. And that's why I like this. Uh, so it's velocity, which is Q over A. Okay, times viscosity times L divided by K. Now, there we go. That's a little better. Okay, and we're looking for the pump rate, right? That's what we're looking for. We've got the length, we've got the area, we've got the absolute perm, we've got the viscosity. You know, it's like watching Friday Kim. You know, it's not that much more complicated. You got the equation, you got all the constants, and you got to figure out which one you don't know. Okay. The biggest problem with Friday crime, with with my family, my wife and I. I get is staying awake. <laughs> it's hard to figure out what happened if you don't stay awake during the class. Okay, so you have to stay awake during class. So we need to have some estimate. And by the way, we set that as well. Okay, so we basically don't know that. So we have to make some reasonable estimate. Okay, reasonable estimate. And where do you get a reasonable estimate for relative permeability? from these equations and the many notes on relative permeability, the, the saturation exponent, whatever. Okay, So basically, we've got some kind of correlation um, that we're going to try to look at using. OK. So then we can calculate, for example, Q assuming K R W equal to one, which we know you don't have, right? 
and then you can make the calculation Q pump for K R W uh, point five, or you could go in and try to make some estimate of for K R W from some estimation of saturation, all these other things. It's it's not easy to figure out exactly what it should be. So you probably have to make a range of these calculations for realistic values of KRW, maybe 0.2. Shouldn't be that low with with 80% water flowing here and 20% oil. You're probably in a range somewhere between here and here, 0.2 to 0.5. Now the pump rate here, this is the water injection rate, right? It's the water phase. But that's equal to Q pump times what? 0. Point what part of the pump rate do we want to be water? Huh? 0.8. This is the water. Everything in this Darcy equation is for a given phase. The water phase we picked, we could have just as well picked the oil phase. So you got the pump times 0.8. Pump rate is what I ask you for. That's what I try to tell the kid. You know, you got to read what it asks you for in you know in the Upgava to get the right answer. Okay. I didn't ask for the rate. I uh, for the rate of water. I asked for the pump rate because the engineer in the laboratory controls this pump here. So it's that's the pump rate we want to get. So it's pump rate times 0.8. So there's only one kind of unknown in this, and we're going to estimate that as maybe being 0.2 and maybe 0.5. And we'll get a range of pump rates that we can tell the, the lab technician you need to be somewhere in this range. Okay? So you basically just solve for Q pump. Okay? Q pump. <coughs> You can move the things around and, and, uh, and solve it. Now this is going to be in what units? Okay. Maybe I should go ahead and solve it for you because units are important. Okay, so we'll get Q. Uh, we'll solve that. Q is equal to, um, move everything over here, delta P times K times KRW over mu w, and then we've got area, and we've got uh, 0.8 is all that's left over there, and then 1 over L. Is that right? I think that's right. Okay, we've got Q pump is equal to delta P K K R W over mu W area divided by the point eights left there and then one over L. Now units are important because otherwise you'll be off a factor of two hundred. You won't get paid. Okay. The units that we know for the Darcy equation were delta P in atmospheres. Okay. Which is about like bar. Uh, we got five bar, five atmospheres. It's close. It's within a couple of percent. K is in Darcy's. A in square centimeters, which we have 10. L in centimeters. And Q is going to be in cubic centimeters per second. So our lab technician is expecting numbers in cubic centimeters per minute. So we've got to do some conversion there. Okay. So this is uh, approximately bar. We got five bar. Um, viscosity is in centipoise, and that's okay. Uh, so we've got the water viscosity, okay. Uh, we get we have to be careful because we'll get cubic centimeters per second. Uh, the Darcy, this is how many Darcy? This five millidarcy. Five millidarcy is how many Darcy's? Something like that. 
area was 10. 10 point, we used water, 0.55 centipoise and 5 bar, 5 atmospheres. And then we should end up getting in this per second. <coughs> they never calculate her out, but that's okay. And then to convert that, cubic centimeters per second, and you times it by 36, no, it was per minute, I said, 60 seconds in a minute. Okay, so you're going to calculate this number and you're going to multiply it by 60 and the guy's going to be, she's going to be so happy in the lab getting this pump rate calculated for her. Okay, anyway, that's that's it. We did it. Question? Oh, no. get, get those elbows off the table. That's why they, your mom and dad taught you that. If you do like that, then the teacher thinks you're asking a question. So, okay. All right, so that's it. I don't think I'm going to construct a problem for an Irving. I, they may make me do it. As a teacher, I may have to do it. And it'll be posted on the uh, It's Learning. I'm not sure. Okay? So we'll see you next year. You don't you don't want to do that. They can't even help you. Like with sugar cube. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if, if I put it in the water and then I press it, then it will become like a porridge. Yeah, you can. You can. Do, that's a little bit like the, the bowl hole chalk. Mm -hmm. The chalk in this reservoir called bowl hole is more like this in, in mechanical strength. Mm -hmm. But the Equipus chalk is a uh, is a more robust. Uh, you know, maybe there's different. Uh, you know, basically chalk is these little animals. That, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right, so it's kind of a different composition. Okay. And uh, the Equifish chalk is a, is a more robust chalk mm -hmm. than the bowl. Okay. And this is less robust. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's why. It's just the chemical composition of the... Okay. Yeah. Just the structure and chemical. Structure mm -hmm. or some kind of, you know, it's not... Okay. Uh, because that's like, like by memory, by children games, it's usually yeah. very yeah. easy to make porridge and chalk. That's exactly <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. I read your memo on the reserve of fluids, and um, at one point you see that the reserve volume factor for volatile oil uh -huh. could be up to three, and that means that when you bring the oil to the surface, it may shrink by a factor of three. Yeah. I find that a bit weird yeah. because isn't you decre you've got a pressure decrease, don't you? Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a. Uh, you know, you'd think it would expand by yeah, two percent. Yeah. yeah. What happens though is that uh, when that oil comes to the surface, uh, you separate out a lot of gas. Mm. And an oil like that would have uh, maybe uh, yeah, because sixty mole percent methane. Yeah, because this volatile oil had a high level of like GOR. That's yeah, a high GOR, and that's yeah. like the methane content. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So if you have a lot of methane, and when you get to the surface a lot of that one cubic meter you started with now is being sold as gas. Mm. And the shrinkage comes from that gas disappearing. Oh, right. from the total volume, exactly. yeah. nothing would be... Oh, exactly. Right. Nothing to do with expansion compressibility. That's right. right. Yes, sir. Yep. Right.